Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, roundtable discussion on effective uh, support Indian economy at the crossroads, which has been brought up by Information Technology and Innovation Foundation of Washington, D.C. I welcome uh, Rob, Steve. would be aware, uh, has been doing some exemplary and seminal work on key aspects of the role of innovation and trade in economic growth. And uh, this report that uh, we have gathered here to discuss uh, looks at both the macro and the micro policy um, reforms that a country like India needs to put into place uh, to catapult it through. Uh, the second generation of reforms which we are all talking about today. Uh, today, with a new government in the helm, uh, we are looking really at reforms 2.0 to reboot, reset the country, and put it back on the track, uh, which somehow seemed to have got lost in the last uh, five, six years. Now, you know, any discussion on economic reforms in India has a special meaning for the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, many people in this room know that this uh, specifically to put together or build a consensus on the policies India needed to undertake to get out of uh, the situation which it had got itself into in the early 90s. So that was uh, 25 years ago, and this is our 25th year. The first publication that this uh, think tank brought out was a slim four or five page uh, report, which was called An Agenda for Reform, and which presented the consensus built amongst various political parties, including the left. At that time, most of the meetings to build that consensus took place not in New Delhi, but because of the leverage which the left had, were actually taking place in Kolkata. And that is where most of the document got written. So with this history, which the Observer Research Foundation has, for us it's, a, you know, it, it, it's a, the, the, the whole debate on what should be the shape of reforms uh, going into the next 10 years becomes very important. And yes, Indian policymakers, as you are aware, are looking at all kinds of ways and means. In fact, the entire country is still looking at ways and means to tackle the opportunity as well as the nightmare uh, that confronts it in the form of India's huge 474 million strong demographic dividend. And for the next 10 years, India is going to keep on adding 1 million more each month which adds up to over 110 million over the next decade, for which it needs to create the necessary skills and the jobs to catapult India into the next phase of growth. So if Indian policymakers can create the macro and microeconomic conditions in which employment generating growth can flourish, India then is well on the way to becoming the new economic powerhouse, not just in itself, but the engine that pulls the whole global economy along, which is something which China was doing in the last few years. And getting these macro and micro policies right, uh, the IMF's prediction of India being the fastest growing global economy by 2017 may actually turn true. But the flip side of it is that if you get the macro and micro interventions wrong, then every choraha and choraha in Hindi means crossroad. Every choraha in every Mufasal town in India can turn into a Tehri square. So this is the dilemma, this both the opportunity and the nightmare which India faces. Now a word about the road we have traversed. 1990 is seen universally as a turning point for the Indian economy uh, when the country opened up to the winds of change 
with decontrol becoming the new mantra for the government. And this watershed is supposed to have marked the end of the country's embrace uh, of this typical brand of Indian socialism, heavily dependent upon extremely interventionist economic policies that bred the country's infamous license Raj. But in our 25th year, as we look back now and look at the path that we have actually traversed so far, uh, we begin to see that the problem with that first phase of reform perhaps was essentially that they remained back to the wall reforms. These are reforms launched under extreme duress. These are reforms undertaken not so much out of conviction or ideological certitude. Rather, they were reforms undertaken because of certain conditionalities which were imposed by lending institutions, which asked the government of the day as part of the conditions to adopt certain measures for economic liberalization. Consequently, many of the reforms which were introduced tended to be rather patchy. So we saw piecemeal reforms in certain sectors, in certain parts of sectors, which would not carry downstream right to the other end. <laughs> the bigger problem remained that these were measures that were foisted upon uh, what was essentially a command and control economy. And the three words which describe the economy was till then was command, control and patronage. Because patronage goes with command and control. So even as the reform measures were pushed, the governance and administrative structures remained more suited to licensing, regulation and control rather than to growth, program management and true market liberalization. And that has remained the central core problem which the Indian economy has faced right down up to the present day. The simple fact is that a system of command and control does not disappear overnight. Because institutions and organizations, once they have been created, once they have been put into place, will always spawn structures of governance, breed structures of governance that reinforce, strengthen and sustain rules and norms that enable it to exercise power and control. And we have been seeing a lot of that happen. Now, this was actually the minefield. It was a minefield upon which the scaffolding of the 1991 reforms was laid. And that is what remains their essential weakness. For instance, you had the PPP model. The PPP model was the public-private partnership model, which was touted as the answer to all of India's ills. The, 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 the one magic wand that would give India 21st century infrastructure, 21st century ports, 21st century roads, bridges, ports, everything uh, through, through that domain. But for reasons, and I, I say there were reasons entirely due with governance, the PPP models implemented were not ever genuine partnerships, but they remained grafts. The award of licenses, their monitoring, and their control post reward remained the core competency of the implementing as well as the regulating agencies. So under such circumstances, it should not have surprised anybody that most of the PPP models which were adopted actually degenerated into little more than license grab. License to be grabbed and then traded. And systems, or I would say the lack of systems, came to be instituted for the award of coal blocks, spectrum, name it, whatever it is, which was then subsequently called into question by authorities like the CAG and like the Supreme Court, and the rest is all history. We need not talk about it. Any reform bound, you know, introduced to this process is bound to be piecemeal. The easiest questions are always solved, solved first. The difficult ones always kick down the road and left for later. And that is how reform measures introduced at, on one end do not pass on down the chain. So instead of fostering competition and let well-run well and properly regulated markets take control, time and again, in sector after sector, we have seen controls implemented through pricing, testing requirements, quasi-regulatory uh, you know, regulations, and a whole host of other things which have been built into it. 
which basically ultimately knocks the bottom out of any reform process that was undertaken. Now, we have now transformed into a new phase under the new government stewardship. A number of big ticket policies have already been announced to meet the aspirations of the large young demographic. The government has launched its Make in India, which is actually India's invitation to the world uh, for both domestic and international companies to invest in India and to manufacture in India. It is a call to arms to exploit the overall competitive advantage that India enjoys in many industrial areas as a result of its demographic dividend and its technological prowess. Now, does Make in India hark back, look back to policies of import substitution, of restrictions, or does it adopt a far more open framework to move ahead is a big question that policymakers need to contend with. Digital India, which has been scripted in part of by one of the panelists who will be joining us just now, sees India as a land of infinite opportunities that can be harnessed through innovation. It seeks to respond to the imperative of making uh, basic service delivery efficient in cities, villages, e-governance across the country. <coughs> the use of technology in India, though widespread, has been very uneven. There are gaps uh, between people from different income classes, across different geographical locations. And technology has, in fact, created exclusions. So how do we move in to make these technologies more inclusive? Now, these are all questions which need to be contended with. There is no question that India has to embrace technology. The immense potential of technological innovation in India lies in the fact that technologies do not spread linearly. The innovative capabilities do not spread linearly, but actually exponentially. But India needs to invest far more of its GDP in R&D. There's a vast potential to upscale innovation, both through greater government and private sector investments. And lastly, you know, today, the lucky thing is that there is something else happening across the world. And India's government is in a position to reap an advantage which no other government possessed in the past. There's been a collapse in energy prices across the world, which is causing a huge, I would call a tectonic shift in wealth from one corner of the globe to another corner of the globe. And you know, the, the IMF estimates are very simple. For every 10% drop in the price of crude results in a 0.2% boost in the global GDP, a $40 price in oil, fall in oil prices literally moves $1.3 trillion from the hands of oil producers to consumers. That's about you know, 40 to 50 billion into the hands of Indian consumers. Now, falling energy prices today have given tremendous room for upside in all consuming countries, provided the right boosts can be given from the correct macro policy interventions. Macro policy interventions do not just concentrate on short-term fiscal management, but put in long-term, stable, wider policy reforms to take advantage of this. So if today there's a fresh surge in optimism regarding the India story, it is because of this very significant turning point. We have a government in the saddle, uh, which is far more clear-sighted on the long-term vision for growth, uh, which India has. Uh, a government which is widely perceived, perceived to have the will to deliver and to take bold decisions. So maybe this is the time to launch the narrative for a new India, uh, an India which will require a lot of courage and a lot of leadership. Now, what are these policy initiatives? That is a subject that demands attention, and that is something which we've gathered here to discuss. Uh, Rob and Steve have in their analysis uh, given some pointer suggestions which need to be thrashed out and debated. And let me tell you, many of them would go against the grain of the kind of uh, policies that Indian policymakers are used to resorting to as a default option. A lot of space in the report has been dedicated to the author's prescriptions on what India can do to become part, actually an integral part of the global value chains which are going to be coming up. 
and we have our two panelists here who are very well you know versed in many aspects of these especially in the ICT sector so i am going to step back now and uh, let the others take control uh, let me first of all invite uh, rob uh, to give us a, a brief overview and then we shall carry on thank you sanjay first of all uh, uh, i want to thank you for uh, hosting us here in india it's it's both a pleasure and an honor uh, we've been long admirers of observer and and the work you do and uh, so it's great to partner on this and, and hopefully uh, this is the beginning of, of other kinds of partnership arrangements. Uh, secondly, I want to say I fully agree with everything you said there um, and want to drill down perhaps a little a little more thank you a little more deeply on uh, on, on some of the points. Um, there we go. Okay. So ITIF, if you don't know of us, we're a think tank in Washington, D.C., and we focus on, uh, I think we're a somewhat unique think tank, certainly in the U.S., perhaps in the world, in the sense that we focus really only on innovation policy questions, with a particular focus on ICT, uh, and uh, so pretty much any policy question that you can imagine related to innovation, we've probably written something on it uh, and been, been involved in the, in the debates. Uh, secondly, uh, we are increasingly engaged around the world and not just in U.S. policy questions. Now, in part, that's a sort of, if you will, customer demand. We get, uh, on a pretty regular basis, I'd say at least once a month, we have delegations coming through uh, Washington who meet with us. I see the ambassador of Estonia is here. We just had a great delegation from Estonia, which I, I sometimes feel when I meet with the Estonians, I feel like I should learn from them rather than the opposite because uh, they're doing such uh, incredible things in this space. But we have delegations all over the world, and, and they always ask the same question. They ask two questions. Why has the U.S. been so successful in innovation, mm -hmm. and what should we do? And that's the questions we've tried to study, both about what's the U.S. doing and has done. Uh, we, wrote, we recently wrote a sort of seminal piece on explaining the uh, understanding the U.S. Uh, innovation ecosystem. And then secondly, what's going on around the world? Um, we've been engaged in a lot of different uh, activities and reports, um, benchmarking global innovation policy, which is, I think, the first time anyone's done that. We looked at 55 countries and said, who's got the best policies to drive innovation? Um, also, uh, the, you can see that right up there, the book, uh, my, um, Stephen, my colleague Stephen Izell, who's really the lead author of this India work, uh, and we'll be talking in a moment, uh, we were asked by Yale University Press uh, several years ago to write a book about this whole question, which we titled Innovation Economics, The Race for Global Advantage. And the book goes through and explains why countries are trying to win this race and who's doing what, and what, in our view, what's the right way to win the race. And we've been following what India has been doing for a number of years. I've had the pleasure of coming to India. I always have great fun, especially when I get to go to Goa, which was my highlight of my entire India uh, visits. Uh, sitting on the beach in Goa, uh, talking to Indian officials, was uh, you can't get any better than that. Uh, so we've been following India with great interest, and particularly since the new administration, and we wrote this report. Now, I should make a caveat to that report. We wrote that report before the Modi administration came in office, uh, and at the time, we, in our view, it was India economy at the crossroads. If we were to issue this report today with a new title, it would be Indian economy on a new path. There's no question that's happened. At the time, though, I think it was a question of there was a crossroads. Clearly, a road has been chosen by the Modi administration, uh, which we've commend and support. I was just uh, in a meeting last uh, week with uh, Minister Sharma in India with, uh, as part of the joint U.S.-India ICT dialogue at the State Department. I made a presentation and I said to the minister, I said, uh, you know, he, he mentioned that he had there were 700 million or so uh, digital uh, identities in India and, uh, that have been issued. And I said, well, that's 700 million more than we have in the U.S. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool things happening in India, which we uh, learn, look to learn from and applaud. But at the same time, I think there's some real questions uh, around the path. So we want to do today, really very quickly, um, talk a little bit about why we think an innovation and productivity-based growth path is the right path and what that really means. 
Secondly, Stephen will talk a little bit about how do you translate that into an effective growth strategy, and then I'll talk briefly about some of the concerns that usually come up when we talk about this with countries. You usually get the same three concerns or so, which we'll talk about. So this is a pretty simple graph, but to me it is the most fundamental graph I will show today. It's kind of obvious, as Paul Krugman once stated, productivity uh, is, is, is the only thing that matters in economics. He went on to say, it. we know economists know nothing about productivity, so he's not going to say anything about it, which I think is actually wrong. I think economists do know about productivity. But productivity grows the pie. If you want to get wealthy, there's really only one way to do it. It's not expanding housing. It's not expanding trade. It's to grow productivity. Now, the challenge for India is that Indian productivity levels are quite low. If you look at this chart, you'll see that India is, uh, these are all level, by the way, compared to U.S. productivity levels. Uh, India is about two-thirds of Chinese levels. Now, 30 years, what, 40 years ago? 30 years ago, India, China was two-thirds of Indian level. So 30 years ago, China was below India. Now, 30 years later, China is above India, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. But I think that really explains a lot. Now, not explains a lot, shows a lot about what the challenge is. It's, in the U.S., there's a, in the 92 election, there was a famous phrase uh, uh, that the Clinton consultants came up with. It was called, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, that, was the, that was the Clinton tagline. I think for any country really, and particularly India, it's productivity stupid. Uh, in other words, it's really productivity. That's at the end of the day. So how's India been doing? Well, okay for a while, but if you look at this chart, really since 2011, annual growth rates of productivity have sagged. And the question is, are those productivity growth rates going to go up? If anybody read the Financial Times today, I think it was, uh, it was a graph that said if India grows at 8% a year annualized GDP and China grows at 5, it's 35 years, 32 years to catch up, 32 years just to catch up to China, not even talking Korea. So the only way to do that, instead of making it 32, make it 20, uh, is, is productivity. Okay, so how do you get productivity? At the end of the day, productivity is about the better use of better tools. In other words, it's about using technology to drive productivity and using it in the right way. What are the tools? Well, obviously there's lots of different tools, if you will. There's chemical, there's electromechanical. These are all important tool sets. But in our estimation, the most important tool set today that's driving growth in every country around the world is the ICT tool set. This is what economists increasingly talk about as a general purpose technology. What a general purpose technology is, is a technology that is used in all functions, all sectors of the economy. You think about a, a technology, for example, like chemical processing. That's used in a bunch of industries, plastics, uh, pulp and paper, chemicals, obviously petroleum. It's not a general purpose technology. ICT is used in the petroleum industry, it's used in the agricultural industry, it's used in the government industry, it's used all across. So really it's about ICT tools. Now the next question we always get, from government officials is, how do we get more ICT tool builders? How do we get more companies who are building ICT, whether it's software or increasingly, I think countries have a hardware fixation, even though the value in software is usually a lot higher. How do we get more tools? Well, the question really then is, is tool building the most important thing or is tool use the most important thing? And in most countries around the world, even China, tool use is the most important thing. Having an economy where you have all enterprises, all sectors, including retail, finance, logistics, uh, trade, government, having tool use is really important. Now, I'm not going to go through this, but it's an OECD study. The dark blue line is tool development. The light orange is uh, tool use. And there's a couple of countries like Ireland and Finland where tool development has been pretty important. Now, with the collapse of Nokia, I sort of moved that. Finland line a little bit farther over. But you can see for most countries, it's tool use. 
So uh, to, to sort of support that, uh, there are a lot of different academic studies which we cite in the report that show that, but I think this is the best study to show this. This is a McKinsey Global Institute study called Understanding the Sources of Growth. And they looked at um, six, they looked at developed countries, but they looked at six emerging economies. Um, you can see that China, India, Brazil, uh, Russia, South Africa, and Mexico. And what you saw was that China did better than India. Okay, that's, everybody knows that. Why? It wasn't because China had semiconductor companies or software companies. It wasn't China's sectoral mix. It wasn't that they got high-tech companies, that, why they grew. You can see over here on the far on your right, it was, not, it was because of the performance within sectors. Chinese retail did better than Indian retail. Chinese banking did better than Indian banking. Okay, so it's a very important finding that McKinsey had there. Now, again, that's not to say that tool building is not useful and important, of course. It's that it's not the most important thing. Okay, so can you get rich by subsidizing tool building? Uh, the Chinese are trying to do that right now. I'm, I'm uh, actually an advisor. Uh, um, I, I co-chair the U.S.-China Innovation Experts Task Force that the White House and, and the Ministry of Science and Technology in China have, and we've been meeting now for about five years, so I follow Chinese tech policy quite closely and actively work with the Chinese government on this. Chinese are essentially putting in place 40 trillion rupees, which is a lot of money, to basically try to get these, what they call strategic in, in emerging industries up higher in their economy. Okay, first of all, they're not, they're not going to succeed, in my opinion, but let's just say hypothetically that they succeed fully in their goal. What will that buy them? That will buy them essentially 14 to 18 months of normal economic productivity growth. So they've spent 40 trillion rupees to accelerate growth by 14 months. Pretty high risk, uh, low reward strategy for the Chinese. Okay, so how do you get tool use? You keep tool prices low. I think that's kind of the core insight. Countries that have a lot of ICT tool use keep the prices low. Um, this is a very good study that we, um, we cite actually in, for many, many countries. Uh, it, this is a great study. Uh, Kasuk and Singh found that when India was imposing tariffs on computers and other things, other imports, with the goal of building a computer industry in China, for every dollar of tariff, they lost a dollar thirty of GDP. Now, as the joke goes, they made it up in volume. Another study found that for every 1% increase in ICT prices, there's a 1.5% decrease in demand. And that number varies uh, to as much as 2.5. So the elasticity of demand is quite high. If you make ICT prices higher, you get less of it. How do you do that? Well, lots of different models around the world. I ICT incentives like accelerated depreciation. Um, I notice here Spectrum. We met with some officials in the telecom ministry. Spectrum's an issue. You know, auctioning Spectrum is the only way to allocate Spectrum, but auctions should try to have the lowest possible prices. Spectrum shouldn't be a, in our view, the goal of spectrum policy is not to raise money. It's to allocate efficiently. If you raise money by doing that, okay. But you shouldn't try to maximize uh, revenue from spectrum. All that does is it raises cellular prices for consumers and business. VAT and excise tax exemption. Um, India has imposed, in a number of cases, certification requirements for products coming in that actually cost money. Companies have to pay to certify products that are already globally certified. They have to pay again. That raises prices. Uh, XX taxes on telecom services. Uh, again, countries, not just India, many countries put taxes on telecom because they think, oh, wealthy people use telecom, poor people don't. Uh, we can get money out of it. Uh, E-waste policies. Again, imposing a lot of stringent e-waste makes countries, uh, makes, uh, makes these products higher. And lastly, trade barriers, tariffs, uh, localization requirements, and the like. Um, what's pretty clear from the evidence around the world is these kind of barriers generally do not create domestic technology industries. In fact, they oftentimes backfire. But they do limit adoption. I think the evidence is very clear. Trade barriers that make it more expensive for foreign ICT products or services raise prices for domestic users. This is a pretty good uh, chart that, that, that Stephen, uh, in a report Stephen did on, on ITA. 
And if you look at um, the countries um, that joined the ITA, the Information Technology Agreement in 96, including India, uh, they're in blue. And this is their uh, percentage change in ICT exports. Um, this is, sorry, this is the amount of ICT exports. The countries that didn't join, very, very small ICT exports. The countries that didn't join the ITA, by the way, in 96, lost 60% share in global value chains in ICT. So you, get on, you got in the ITA, you saw your, sh as a group, you saw your share of global value added in ICT grow. You didn't get in the ITA, you saw it shrink by 60%. That's why, in our view, ITA2 is such an important thing. Lastly, on this point, uh, I, I read with interest uh, the, the chicken dispute here, um, which I don't take a stand on. I have no idea. I don't, I don't know anything about chickens. Um, but I do know that fundamentally, if, if you want, let's say hypothetically that you're not value, you, you know, you, what you're doing is not valid, and I have no idea whether it is or not. At the end of the day, all you're doing is raising the prices of chicken. That's all you're doing. So Indian consumers might eat a little more fish or maybe they eat a little bit more meat or a little bit more vegetarian. Chicken prices go up. Had a lot, not a lot of damage to your economy. You put high prices on ICT, though, and ICT users, all of the BPO industry in, China, in, 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 in India, all the telecom industry, all the banks, everybody who uses ICT now pays higher prices. Their capital goods stock will go down, and they will suffer because of that. Chicken tariffs, who cares? I'm sure the chicken producers here and their care, I fundamentally don't. Uh, Thank you, Rob. So I thought I'd share a few thoughts on how India can drive an effective economic growth strategy. So in the report, we really contextualize countries' economic development and growth models into two categories. Countries can fundamentally pursue an export-led growth strategy that seeks to decrease imports while increasing exports, or they can pursue an innovation-based economic growth strategy that looks to increase productivity growth and innovation for all their companies and industries across the board. And within those two categories, those policies can have different types of effects or aims, whether or not they are targeted toward domestic or to foreign enterprises. So if you think about general mercantilist policies, such as currency manipulation, and we've argued pretty persuasively that China undervalues its currency by about 25%. What that does is provide a blanket subsidy to all exporters of products from China, whether or not they are domestic or foreign enterprises, and similarly imposes uh, a, 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 a challenge for firms that would import into China. Countries can also try to increase their exports by implementing what we call localization barriers to trade. These are policies such as local content requirements for the local production of information and communication technology products or solar cells or the localization of data centers. Uh, but their intent is to pressure foreign enterprises to produce more in a country. And finally, countries can pursue what we call indigenous innovation policies. These are policies that very specifically look to favor domestic enterprises, uh, such as by making it more difficult for foreign firms to compete in the marketplace or by providing explicit production or export subsidies uh, or R&D assistance only to local firms. And then at the top, you have what we call enterprise support policies that really look to help all firms in all industries, whether large or small, in boosting their productivity and innovation potential. And I think as we look at the evolution of the Indian uh, economy over the past several years, maybe what you saw is that the Singh administration, to some extent, was, was pushing uh, more to this uh, lower uh, right-hand quadrant uh, with, with increasing uh, localization barriers to trade, like the PMA, uh, like solar requirements. Uh, and uh, f fortunately, it appears that the Modi administration with a Make in India uh, approach, which is more of an invitation for companies to produce in India, not a compulsion that they have to, seems to be fortunately moving uh, back toward the enterprise support category. Uh, you can also idealize countries' manufacturing strategies. Uh, so some countries have a policy 
uh, that they seek to uh, make virtually everything in their country and also sell it to the world. So if you look at China's new medium to long-term plan for science and technology development, they've identified 402 key technologies and industries in which China seeks absolute advantage. It wants to be the dominant player in global markets in those industries. It wants to completely service the Chinese market with its own domestic production, but also be able to export to the rest of the world. Some countries, like Brazil, have adopted what we call a strategy of autarky. This means they want to make most products in their country and really sell most in their country. So they're not as much concerned about exporting to the rest of the world. They want to fill their own marketplace, the own domestic market demand with their uh, own production. But the best strategy really is to embrace the notion of comparative advantage. This is what Germany has done, for example. It specializes in making some things, in Germany's case, like machine tools or cars, and selling them locally and also to the rest of the world, but then trading for the rest, buying for the rest. So Germany does not have a world-leading ICT manufacturing industry. It trades for that, and it exports other products. So I think uh, there's a, a, a challenge for India to think about its Make in India strategy and which of the three buckets it would place it in. Now, in our report, we argue that countries really have to get right what we call the economic growth pyramid, which has four stages. First, they have to get key framework conditions right. Uh, this is the environment for doing business, making it easy to start and close a business, strong, effective governance, low levels of corruption, a state of trust, uh, effective protections for intellectual property rights. If you look at the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index, last year India ranked 132. And I think the Modi administration is to be commended for saying that within three years we want to be in the top 100 and in five years in the top 75 of countries. Moving India substantially up that World Bank Ease of Doing Business should be one of the most important goals. But secondly, countries have to get their tax, trade, and regulatory environment right. Uh, this is uh, embracing liberalized trade, clear, stable, and predictable tax policies and regulations. Um, in our report, we note that after the economic and trade liberalization reforms of 1991, the Indian economy grew 40% faster per year in the ensuing two decades than it did in the two decades before. These first two parts of the pyramid are about getting those types of policies right. Also, countries, of course, have to get key factor inputs, such as physical and digital infrastructure, a skilled workforce, and investment in knowledge creation right. Uh, these are the inputs that allow your businesses to compete effectively. And I think India has made laudable progress here, certainly with the Digital India Initiative. Uh, I think there's some challenges with regard to the physical infrastructure. We cite in the report the fact that it takes an ICT manufacturer in India eight days to get an imported product from port to its manufacturing plant, whereas it takes less than one day in China. It takes seven times as long for a lorry to move 100 kilometers in India as it does in China. Ensuring stable electricity supply and strong physical infrastructure will be key to attracting that advanced manufacturing India wants. And then finally, countries have to get innovation and productivity policies right. Uh, India is to be commended for having the most generous R&D, research and development tax credit of any developing country in the world. Um, some of the strongest uh, support policies for small manufacturers. Uh, but uh, these innovation and productivity policies uh, help to maximize the innovation potential of all firms. So there are really two key tenets of revitalized economic growth for India. The first, as Rob said, is to recognize the centrality of ICT, especially the use of ICT in enterprises, and enabling access to best-in-class ICT products and services. So here, in terms of policy recommendations, we applaud the Indian government repealing the application of the preferential market access policy from the private sector although because it still applies it to government 
procurement of ICT products. Uh, this uh, is not fortunate for Indian citizens because it means they may not be getting access to the most cost-efficient and productive ICT capabilities available. Um, uh, we think it's also important that India look to repeal the inverted duty structure that exists for ICT products and also join the Information Technology uh, 2 agreement. There's, we think, an unfortunate sense that India having joined the Information Technology Agreement in 1996 was problematic to the competitiveness of its ICT manufacturing industry, in part because uh, a higher share of Chinese imports of ICT products have occurred. It's also important that India play an attraction, not a compulsion game, by becoming the location of choice for multinational investment. There's actually a unique opportunity right now. Many foreign multinational enterprises we talk to are fed up with Chinese government policies. Their intellectual property is not being protected. They're being forced to manufacture and, and transfer their technology there. There's a unique moment for India to be a, the China in the sense that it provides a superior alternative investment environment for global companies. And it can do that uh, by, uh, we argue, an attraction strategy, a strategy of carrots, of predictable policy making, investment incentives, a highly skilled workforce, <laughs> robust infrastructure, reasonable tax structure, protection of IPR rights, and no use of compulsory policies, as opposed to using these uh, methods that try to force manufacturing to occur in the country, like local content requirements or data localization policies, and some of the other ones I have listed here. In fact, it would be a great moment for the Modi administration to announce a compact with global industry and make a promise to all companies that, uh, for example, uh, we will not force you to transfer your technology to manufacture here. We will not force local production. We will not do retroactive taxation. If there were a five to ten point compact with global industry the Modi administration could put forward, I guarantee a great amount of manufacturing would flow from the rest of East Asia into India. So then in conclusion, we think this is a central slide showing the challenge of the future. Will India's policies move from the export-led strategy to one focusing on increasing productivity and innovation across the board for all of its industries? So, great. So let me just close by responding to a couple of potential concerns. Uh, I'm sure there's probably a lot that I, you have that I don't respond to, but I, I just want to reiterate this last point that Stephen made. You know, I remember five years ago when we started engaging with China in a pretty serious way, uh, the technology companies that we would talk to in, in a wide variety of sectors all had these eyeballs that were like a kid at a Christmas tree. They were like, this is great. China is going to be fantastic. Let's not rock the boat. Man, China is so great. What I've seen in five years is almost a 180-degree shift. Companies are now saying, hold on a minute here. I don't know how many people follow the China issues very closely, but they have a new thing called the AML, the anti-monopoly law, which they use as a bludgeon to bludgeon foreign companies, Volkswagen, uh, Apple, Qualcomm. So they're not just U.S., they're Japanese, European. So there's a whole set of po and, they, and and they bring in executives. They bring in these are true stories. They will bring in CEOs, force them to sit in a room without an attorney for eight hours until they confess. Okay, this is not about the rule of law. This is not about an open environment. And so there's a lot of frustration now with China. And I think there's a real, as I said, as Stephen said, a real opening, a real window. For a country to come and say, look, we want you here, we need you here, we want to grow manufacturing and technology here, and we're going to do all the good things that China used to do from, say, 1990 to 2005, and we're going to avoid the bad things. So let me talk about three quick concerns. One, I read in every, the, the papers I've been reading every day here, they almost every one of them has a story about how it's critical that India has to become like China in order to grow. In other words, run big, big trade surpluses. The economic evidence shows that you don't. So uh, if, we, if we looked at uh, 50, of large nations with 50 million or more, now 50 million seems small to you, I'm sure, but we'll, we'll call it large, medium and large, correlation between trade surpluses and the unemployment rate is very, very small. 
So there are lots of countries that run trade surpluses that have job growth. There's countries that run trade deficits with job growth. It's just not that big a deal. Secondly, do you need a lot of manufacturing for job growth? And, and by the way, just so we're clear, India doesn't have enough manufacturing. Uh, and we it, applaud the goal to increase yeah. from 16 to 25%. So it's, it's too small. I agree with that. But you should be, again, realistic here. More manufacturing is not a panacea in and of itself. What this is is a just a you know, correlation coefficient uh, for about 250, 230 countries. And the one here basically shows uh, in 2013, what was the correlation between how much manufacturing you have and how much your unemployment rate is. And you can see it's negative. The higher your share of manufacturing, the higher your unemployment rate. The chart over here on the other side is about change 91 to 2013. If your manufacturing grew, your unemployment rate grew. So again, don't get us wrong. Manufacturing is important. You need more manufacturing, but it can't be the panacea. It's got to be innovation, and part of Digital India is all is about putting digital and ICT in all around India. So that we applaud. And lastly, with as we hear this everywhere, even frankly, our president, President Obama, has said this. Uh, Perhaps our next president, Marco Rubio, uh, you know, Senator Rubio, he's a leading Republican. He said this just yesterday. This is across the board. Everybody in the world has bought into this notion. We can't have productivity because we need the jobs. The thing, the evidence is overwhelmingly by economists, by economic studies, high productivity does not lead to fewer jobs. In fact, the, I, uh, the, excuse me, the uh, UNIDO, UNIDO uh, found in a big study they did of, of employment and productivity in developing countries, countries that had higher rates of productivity had higher job growth. The World Bank has found the same thing. Uh, ILO has found the same thing. Multiple, multiple studies. So, yes, high productivity can hurt individuals. They can get laid off, but it doesn't affect overall employment in economies. High productivity is actually good for good for job growth. So uh, I don't think that's something that we need to really be worrying about. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, happy to, I'm really interested in hearing our comment, comment, commentators and respondents, and there's our contact information. If you want to ever follow up with us, we're happy to respond by email. Uh, thank you, um, Rob and Stephen. I'm sorry for being a little late uh, on a direct flight from London and via home to, to this place. Uh, so um, uh, let me uh, start off by saying that um, there is uh, the innovation ecosystem. Uh, we've all, you know, Digital India, as you rightly said, um, is uh, of course a platform to provide uh, a lot of digital services, but also a platform to talk about innovation. And that's something that uh, let's uh, we need to talk about today. And I'll, a lot of things that you have mentioned as recommendations, thankfully, are, are being addressed there. It's all work in progress, and that's a very important thing because, you know, um, coming Monday we would have been uh, in go uh, in government for about 240 days. Uh, we still have a mandate for 1,700 more days. So there's a lot to be done. Uh, the road ahead is, uh, and especially in this area. So uh, to to start, uh, and I think you've uh, talked about that uh, very eloquently in your uh, presentation, the government of the day recognizes the importance of innovation and research in 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 amplifying and enabling growth. And it's, it's a, one of the key pillars. Um, Digital India is a part of that thinking, number one. Number two, within that, what is the innovation steps or steps to, pro, uh, to promote innovation? Uh, let me give you a few examples. Uh, for the first time, software products as a category was talked about in the budget. It is, you know, um, uh, India has been a great outsourcing destination and that is generally what gets identified as software, unfortunately. If somebody works in um, in a company which provides outsourcing services, he, he or she is generally termed as a software engineer, which is fair, which is fine. But uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the job of creating new products <coughs> and new technologies where IP is the one that resides in our country, where value creation happens. And you give a very great example of China. Uh, a lot of us, I don't, uh, use iPhones, right? Manufacturing is done in China. Uh, marketing is done globally. But the IP resides 
in US. And that's where out of the $600 of se the selling price, uh, I think 80% of the IP goes back to the US and that's what gets reflected in Apple's stock. Right? And this is not something that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we need to teach or preach about. Everybody is aware of the same. So the, the, the government is very clear about the creation of IP in India. So that's why a category of products was introduced in the interim budget uh, that was presented last year. Uh, there has been a lot of engagement since then on what should be defined as products, what should be the policies around list in India, create IP in India, and con contain that IP in India. The fact that you mentioned about ease of doing business, and I am, um, we are very clear on that. We are not proud of the fact that we are 130 plus on that list. We want to be in the top 50 in the, in the coming few years. And, but it's not, as I said, it's a work in progress, right? It's not going to happen overnight. But it's also the ease of doing business in creating companies. Somewhere I saw uh, uh, a recommendation on creating companies, but as a startup person, I've, I've, uh, I've been a startup entrepreneur both in the US and in India. I, I know how difficult it is to close companies in India. And that's actually even more challenging. And uh, that's one thing also we are trying to change because if a company is uh, invested in, you need to, as an angel investor, uh, close that company, book your losses, and move on to the next next company, right? And uh, I think uh, uh, there has been a lot of thinking in that. Um, for, a, for, a, for a welcome change, the, the, uh, both the uh, finance ministry, the prime minister's office, and the IT ministry has been very engaged with the product community. And uh, why I mention and emphasize upon that is, uh, is that it is this that will be the next $100 billion industry from India. We dream of creating the next Googles, Facebooks, or, or the Twitters, or whosoever, WhatsApps from India. Currently, we are their biggest users, if not the biggest, maybe the second biggest user of all these platforms. But you know, none of the IP comes to India. So uh, the government is very conscious that we need to create the next uh, set of uh, uh, stars in the innovation and the product space. Now, uh, I have a lot of points that I do want to mention. While we are conscious of the fact that innovation and research are the key levers to deliver digital India, make in India, I think the distinguishing factor between research and innovation, and they both need to happen in parallel. It's, it, it, it's not that e it's a choice between either and or. And innovation and research is often over uh, mixed and uh, misunderstood. I personally feel innovation is something which is practical and achievable in the real time, in, 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 in a very uh, realistic time very soon. Uh, it may not be uh, research driven. It may not be academic research. And uh, the government recognizes that, that the need to prosper this kind of innovation, which can create to solve issues of quality of life of citizens, which is local in nature, uh, needs to be funded. Uh, so another step that was has been taken and is again being talked a lot about is creating a fund, which is an innovation fund, and uh, probably at arm's length distance. Uh, but creating a fund of fund where government becomes an equal partner in that fund and the experts go about investing in using that fund in companies which are innovating, are solving problems for the country, uh, but probably are applicable globally. So that co-creation model that you talked about is something that we are very heavily talking about. Make in India, to sell in India, but also sell to the world. And that's very important. Uh, unfortunately, as of today, we only probably make 2% of the hardware and software that we consume in this country. And that brings about the whole uh, uh, issue of uh, access and affordability. Local language content, local language uh, software availability is a big, big uh, issue. And while we embark on this whole issue of digital India, literacy itself is an issue. So we have embarked upon a program of digital literacy where we may just leapfrog uh, traditional literacy definitions. And um, we're seeing that every day. People know how to use um, phones and, uh, uh, you know, give, uh, give voice commands and play around with things which, are, which require normal literacy levels, but they are digitally literate. So a massive program to, to create digital literacy, uh, basic uh, 
skills in cyber security means how do you secure yourself on online transactions how do you avoid spams is online spams is all being worked towards so it's a, so so digital india program for a change is a comprehensive program it's just not a new terminology that has been introduced it's a program which looks at creating infrastructure affordability access content right and all supported by local innovation and a ecosystem for access to to sell to the market the big challenge if you talk to the innovators and product developers from india is it takes them a lot of time to reach and sell to the government and the central psus the psus basically public sector units so and which is one of the biggest markets so if i have a problem which solves let's say a portion of a it's a, it's a it's a cutting edge technology product which solves a problem in cyber security or um, you know i am not going to have revenues uh, of um, to to qualify for a lot of tenders so how do you solve that problem can I, can a, a company which is recognized by a a, a, a government supported incubator qualify to to sell to the government also solves a lot of these issues so there is a thinking on that front so as i say the, 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 it's the digital india program is not about just one portion that give everybody internet access that is required that's a basic hygiene factor but how do you create a ecosystem for innovation for products for local language content there's a big program going on to digitize content see we have uh, we don't have a digital library in india there's so much of content that's not discoverable today because it's not digitized uh, the use of libraries is at a abysmal low in the country the physical libraries so so online libraries creating digitizing content so it's so for a change it's a program which is a very comprehensive program looking at all aspects of how do you create a digital ecosystem right there are hiccups that are on the way there are lot of laws which are on the way uh which which are being relooked at the ease of doing business even though the i think the companies act was last revised uh, in the parliament or accepted in the parliament about a year ago only since the new government has taken shape 20 new uh, 20 20 to 30 more changes has been done uh in the last 7 to 8 months right so we are recognizing the in the, in this and especially in the ever changing world of technology um the laws need probably will never be able to keep space with what is required in the technology world some recent examples in delhi you have seen that um the the taxi cases the uh, aggregators the marketplaces these are t- these are things which are evolving um, uh, every 6 to 8 months so we need to we uh, for a change we understand that uh, there needs to be new definitions there's a definition of an aggregator there's a definition of a marketplace and it's a, it's a this whole world is innovating ar- around those so when um, when we are disintermediating so many products and creating jobs at the bottom of the pyramid using you know with new all this new technology and innovation i think uh, uh, all these structures of taxation of laws of uh, of liability need to be thought about again and re looked at so uh, there's a fresh thinking on that um, what the government also wants to promote is via this whole digital india program is a is a new set of entrepreneurs and job creation and i want to talk about it for a few minutes today uh, i think we recognize that uh, if you put the right technology and educate people they they do go about finding markets and jobs for themselves it's a, it's a, the it's very important the government needs to play a role of a facilitator to meet uh, to make the buyer and seller meet or create an environment where the buyer and seller or the job seeker and the, and the job giver meet a lot of people as i said are not connected the way we are connected on a smartphone so uh, to enable the use of technology at the bottom of the pyramid in a very inclusive manner is also one of the mandates and i do want to talk about that the jandhan yojana is a great example of that jandhan yojana today you can access not using a smartphone you can access it 
or on a smartphone of course or on the on on the web but also on a plain simple mobile phone the basic mobile phone and that shows the thinking of the government so if you create a new online job exchange which is available only to the 20 20% of india but not to the 80% who is not connected there is a effort going on how you can enable the same messaging and alerting system on a sms based uh, uh, pipe or a sms ussd based system don't want to get into too te technical things but the 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 message being how can we more inclusive in the use of technology till the time access gets provided infrastructure reaches everybody and areas of job creation opening your markets globally as a small uh, manufacturer in any part of india in, in up or in northeast or in south how can i open my markets to the world while i go about doing uh, connecting people can i parallelly also make sure that they they you know their livelihood and their quality of life is still improved in a disconnected mode also and we 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 are going about connecting all of them there is a big the digital india has a aim that by 2020 every there will be there will be connectivity to every household of india and that's that's a very ambitious aim it may not be to every single person but to every single household right so somebody in the house will definitely be connected and be digitally literate and uh, uh, the numbers would be staggering today's uh, with 200 million plus internet penetration that we have in india um, that number reaches a billion people uh, i think uh, that's the dream that we have and you can see how fast uh, the economy will uh, will develop um, there is also a big concern that we have with what is called shelfware and um, shelfware is uh, we buy all these products but never use them right so the uh, there is a lot of thinking about how do you really uh, get the right return on investment for tools and technologies that you have procured but really are not using them in the correct processes and the right uh, uh, i mean it, it's not being used at all sometimes so under utilization of the current products that we have brought the current uh, enterprise level software we have bought current technologies we have bought how do you leverage them the better to increase productivity and operational efficiencies is also a key thing of the government and uh, and that's why i call it a comprehensive vision it's not just solving one pieces of it it's thinking about solving multiple pieces of the puzzle and there is a lot of uh, work happening there um i do want to again emphasize on the fact that the make in india program and you also commented on the same is uh, it's somewhere in between the the chinese the brazilian and german that that model because it talks about make in india sell to the world co create in india localize in india co -colla collaborate with indian companies to make make and co create in india to sell to india of course because you have local markets but it does not prevent anybody to come if i we get better technology where we are not creating in india it does not make a compulsory requirement that you have to have to make in india to solve a problem which which we we need to solve because there is an opportunity cost of not solving that right so if there is a healthcare technology or a education technology that we need to adopt then we will adopt that but while we go about co creating here so um those are some of the points i wanted to mention um some are uh, you know based upon what you have talked about some are new things but um, in conclusion the uh, i think it's a welcome change that innovation is being talked about research is being talked about a lot more and how that will ensure ip creation value creation and really uh, companies which carry the brand of uh, made in india make in india globally um and it's 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 a, it's an enabler it's the i always say it's the uh is the 11th tool means if you are already if you're going to go around building uh more hospitals you're going to build around more schools we'll continue doing that there's nothing nothing that is going to stop that right but while we are doing building more schools making more hospitals we are also looking at how technology can help in solving the healthcare issues the education problems training the teachers creating better teachers better uh, you know uh, enabling the students who want to learn a lot more 
in all in using technology so while we are going to create all the basic infrastructure required technology can be an enabler to solve some of the problems of scale and reach that will take many years to, from a from a physical perspective but technology probably will just speed up the process so uh, there's a there's a good thinking in that healthcare is one area education is the other area um you know virtual classrooms telemedicine is all being talked about and financial inclusion i've already uh, given you the great example of uh, prime minister jandan yojana and that is uh, you know uh, how technology has become a very relevant enabler to uh, get uh, more and more people uh, included in the financial system uh, new efforts in digital payments uh, the digital ecosystem uh, in the whole aspect of cyber security securing our digital assets uh, are also being made so uh, those are some of my remarks in conclusion good morning everybody a good day actually uh, it is a pleasure to be here and thanks for the opportunity to comment normally uh, i was when i was asked yesterday to do that i don't normally do it but it just because i want to have read the report fortunately steve had shared the pre publication draft last year so i had actually gone through this so that uh, so i'm happy to come and talk, uh, talk about it i don't have too much time but let me just say it's a comprehensive report it covers a lot of ground though admittedly i think it is as you all will if you those of you have had a chance to look at it it's a well trodden uh, area so you might say what is what is new and i think there are particular aspects of this report which i thought were valuable and i'd like to flag it and then maybe take issue with some of them so one of them is that first of all they do put a lot of concrete international data and information and in sort of in a comparative perspective you may not agree with some of the comparisons but at least you have a framework and a point of departure so let's number one why i think it's a secondly i think it's a very valuable report because it has done move the locus of debate i'm surprised when i i can move back to india 5 years ago it has been surprising to me how much some of the debate related to let's say industrial policy or manufacturing or uh, even trade generally tends to be still in mired in the basic mindset of import substitution versus export promotion and as you can see in the original uh, in their uh, presentation they are sort of putting it look look the debate locus is now export promotion they use the word mercantilist and i'll take it through that versus innovation and productivity and i think that's and i think that is the particular area where we need to focus on the other thing i'd say uh, just a, a little bit of a qualification as they themselves pointed out this report was written uh, before the advent of achedin so um you know or you know i think uh, so it is a little bit um, you know where we are coming from and projecting from there where we might be heading and in that context it may be i think a little polemical and uh, certainly do not agree with some of the specifics especially the labels like mercantilist i don't think by any standard indian policy even when we you can say that they are trade restricting or they really fall into the domain of mercantilist but i would say having put those are minor quibbles broad contours there is much to agree with the report and i said before uh, you have moved the needle uh, we you've also moved the needle in very specific thing because amongst economists and i've been actually in many debates recently where people are still saying manufacturing versus services etc and i think there for example they put very clearly the point that there is a economic rationale for having a larger manufacturing sector but i think when you go to the second generation of reforms we need to be a little more nuanced and address complexities based on evidence and this is where i just less of criticism of the report but i think some of the opinions that we find in our own political and policy discourse i find frankly and and it's not just the op-eds incidentally my term for it is oh, they are fact free you can pretty much you tell i can even before i lay uh, read the whole article i can usually tell what uh, by the author what what the uh, thing will be said too many re reports even reports and i have uh, in the course of 5 years worked in diff within government outside government together with government elsewhere too many of the reports both inside and written by think tanks are written with conclusions preordained so that's a problem and i think that's where reports like this 
is in providing, you know, the value they provide in spelling out some of the data and analysis underlying the records. As I said, if you don't agree with them, you can go back and say, okay, I would, my logic takes me elsewhere. Secondly, I think, uh, again, and this is, uh, I'll quit the generality soon, but it is very valuable that it focuses essentially on microeconomics. In India, we think macro, you know, countrywide policy we associate with macro. That's not macroeconomics. Macroeconomics is the e economics of aggregate fluctuations. And we talk about microeconomic solutions, but we put macro argument. So I believe in India, we have a total obsession with macro, more specifically monetary policy. I personally have said so on other occasions. I think uh, monetary policy is overrated. Central banks are overrated in terms of their importance. That's not a comment on the current governor. Uh, but uh, the, what they can do in terms of sustaining growth, I don't think macro policy, monetary policy is going to do much. Even fiscal policy here, if you look at almost all the 90% of the discourse on fiscal policy is on aggregate deficits and all that. What this report is actually looking at even in the, those areas is looking at the microeconomics. And that's where the uh, uh, action is. The composition and effectiveness of expenditure, what do we spend it on? You know, almost all the things, go and look at all the articles you've say, read, where even people are arguing for one or the other. They'll tell you, we're going to spend so much more on roads or so much more on health or this has been cut. Which it shouldn't matter how much we spend. It is what you're getting out of it. And that's where we have a big problem. We spend horribly, inefficiently, ineffectively. And that's, and that's why we have, you know, with all the expenditure, we don't get the public service that we need. So even on trade, we have an export fetish. Everybody talks about, let me give you an answer. If you go to anybody, they'll t always tell, talk to you about the aggregate value of exports. But nobody talks about the value added. And I think if you go back to the argument that they are making about, is it, that's where we need to focus on. Today, let me tell you, look at the export import intensity of areas where government is promoting exports. And I'm not talking about this government, I'm talking because we don't know this government's foreign, uh, foreign trade policy. In the past, we are promoting exports which may even be negative value added. So in terms of aggregate balance, it's not what, uh, what, what we should be doing. Okay, so let me, uh, in gatherings such as this, the appropriate role of a panelist, or more precisely a discussant, is not to engage in a direct debate, of, um, but rather to provoke a discussion that I hope that some of all the people here can uh, actively participate in. So I, I was, um, you know, those of you might see from the way I started that, oh my God, this guy is going to give his own views. No, so I want to lay out two areas where I think, and it was also the topic of discussion when we met last year, we can locate that in a few areas of the top priority of government. And what is this report saying? Where do we agree and where do we don't? I would say today, if I have to look at where the action of what government is trying to do, one is make in India. Another one is another area which is not tabled like that, but the government did one of the first actions had to do with intellectual property, IP. There are a couple of other areas, I would say, which are very high priority here, which is digital India and smart cities, and actually a third one is skilling. I won't get into those, but let's just take those two because this report is very germane to them. I believe in both of those areas, manufacturing and intellectual property, the government, at least the political leadership, has the right instincts. And they are actually, the, so that's the good news. Certainly, I think they have the right instinct. And as an economist, I've actually spent a quarter, quite a lot of time doing some analysis, uh, fairly rigorous analysis. I think the instinct, the general direction objective is right. The, that's the good news. The bad news is I believe the government is still struggling to figure out what is to be done in both of these areas. I mean, I don't think, for example, in making India the contours, the parameters that are important, the policy instrument, or even the policy instrumental objectives are clear. And just, not just here, also, in, as I said, smart cities and skillings. But those are topics for another day. My big fear in both of these areas is that this effort can be derailed as it has been on other occasions, in prior occasions. Many governments have tried making India with similar things, but they have not worked. And it is a problem that is the derailment can occur from two very different Sources. One is vested interests without, within India, the people who are pushing in particular direction. Secondly, half-baked ideas prescribed from abroad as well as whether it's Indian or non-Indians. So it's not today, for example, in let's take manufacturing. I do believe it's a complex subject. We need to do more. 
I was at Nimrana at the beginning, but all the key policymakers of the government, uh, government and inside and outside, who are anybody you can talk about, were there. But let me tell you, the discussion on manufacturing was all about doing business. Now, doing business is important as a necessary condition, but certainly not sufficient. Manufacturing, if you're talking about going forward, has certain specifics which we need to address. The, the report itself talks about the inverted duty structure, but there are a couple of others which we can get into. So let me take an issue where the U.S. generally, and I think ITIF itself, was instrumental, but certainly uh, people they've been interlocuting. We had a, great, a big debate on the preferred market access. As you know, that was a major bone of contention in Indo-U.S. strategic relations last year. All of our partners, and in the industry that we are in, we have people on all sides. There, were, there was war. I, I can only say that. Let me go back. Now, <clears throat> my argument, I'll put six points on, very simply on the table, and it's worth discussing and thinking about. Obviously, we can't resolve it. Number one, clearly... There is an economic rationale for a country of India's size and other par parameters to promote manufacturing. I'm specifically using the word promote more than saying that we should have a larger manufacturing sector. I can make an economic argument. Mm -hmm. Number two, which was a big source of I think the strategic use of government procurement is a tried and trusted instrument in many countries around the world. This is something that they, I think the report clearly takes issue with. But I think uh, I, I can equally well. Now, having said that, I will say that in the past, we have screwed up in the past. We have used this, this sort of gov with similar instruments and messed up. And actually, been, it has, we are right that it has actually been costly to Indian industry. In the, so I actually, I will say that I have even written on it and can communicate it to government. PMA was not a well-designed approach, and I'm glad that it was suspended. However, that doesn't mean that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. Number one, we need to tell lessons from China and other countries are misunderstood and misrepresented. We don't have time for it, and we can, we can do it. Number two, the advent of global change. So even if you took the lessons from China or Taiwan or Korea, which are the three examples which you often take, or even Brazil, which I've looked at, the advent of global value chains in the last decade have changed the game totally. And we have to figure out where it is advantageous and not advantageous. On the one hand, it allows us to get in much more easily. Entry is possible, but on the other hand, it means the nature of competition is difficult. So this is an area where I think it, this report would be a good point of departure for our own internal policy debate. Second one, this is uh, just to be very quick, and I'm sorry if I'm, this is a little bit of a rapid fire. Intellectual property rights. This is a hot area. I understand that the government and industry is under a lot of pressure. And it's coming to a head with this Obama visit. Okay. Uh, it's coming to a head. Uh, if I'm actually in being engaged in somebody where people have been telling me both within from government and outside what sort of pressure there. I'm not an expert, but I have actually uh, been following the topic. Perhaps more closely than many people. It's very closely related to the heart of this issue of knowledge-based capital. And if you're interested about knowledge economy and things like that, you better understand what this is all about. And a lot of the policy discussion in India is confused. We all know that the government started off by setting up an IPR think tank. I have yet to see any sort of, I have no idea what their framework is, how they are addressing it. Sectoral differences are huge. Even in the US, the difference between, you know, phar pharma and software is very different. And, you know, and simplistic economics, e.g., for example, ignoring certain facts on the ground can lead us astray. Let me give you my own example. When you think about the idea of patent assertion entities, the whole issue of patent trolls, which are very controversial in America, you think as an economist.